nous fait plaisir de recevoir Antoine Georges aujourd'hui. Euh, donc, je vais, euh, il a été généreux de, durant son passage euh, à Montréal de venir nous rendre visite. Juste pour faire un peu, euh, peut-être un petit euh, sommaire de son cheminement. Donc, il est euh, professeur au Collège de France, mais aussi peut-être peut plus important. Euh, I will switch to English just because there might be some colleagues that are better in this language. He's also director of the CCQ. This is the Center for Computational Quantum Physics at the Flat Iron Institute. Um, this is where he plays a major role into the developments of computational methods to for uh, analyzing materials. He's did his study at the Ecole Polytechnique et Ecole Normale Supérieure in France. Uh, I've learned that uh, Pierre-Gilles de Gênes was his uh, president of PhD committee. He then did a postdoc at Princeton with uh, Phil Anderson, so he was uh, meeting quite important people. Um, Antoine received quite a lot of numbers awards during the years. Um, let me mention that last year he received the Fensburg Memorial Medal, along with Gabriel Cochlear for the developments of DMFT. In 2020, he received the APS Prize Award for the Computational Physics. And in 2018, he got an honorary doctorate degree from the University of Pembroke. <laughs> He's also a member of the French Academy of Science. Uh, on a personal note, let me just mention that uh, Antoine uh, is a good friend of our network. He supported, he's supporting the uh, summer school that André Marie is a pioneer and along and uh, help co organizing. So he's a very supporting of that school and co contributes uh, every time we do it. So we, like, we thank him uh, for that. So, Antoine, we look forward for your presentation. Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup, Michel. Uh, je vais, uh, I will speak English, but I'll say a few words in French first. Uh, donc, c'est mon grand plaisir d'être uh, uh, aujourd'hui à l'Université de Montréal. Uh, c'est la première fois que je viens, uh, je viens dans cette université et ça me fait plaisir de rencontrer uh, tous les collègues. Uh, so now I'll switch to English. Um, and uh, today I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you about um, uh, strongly correlated electron materials. And the main message of the, of the talk is uh, to point out that besides the standard well-established routes to uh, creating strong correlations in materials, namely the materials which are close to multi insulators and materials which are uh, uh, perhaps more in the heavy fermion category, there is a third route which has uh, become uh, prominent recently in which co strong correlations are induced by the Hund's rule coupling. And this is uh, what I want to mostly uh, talk about today. Uh, so um, we all know that uh, strong electronic correlations uh, in materials are characterized by, just on a purely phenomenological basis, by uh, collective phenomena that appear in materials. And there are many of them, for example, magnetism or superconductivity or transition metal uh, or, or metal insulator transitions. Uh, and these collective phenomena lead to a number of competing phases. And we all know that uh, the phase diagrams of materials with strong electronic correlations are often quite complex and display many phases in competition because the, these different collective phenomena are separated by have energy differences which are small, hence leading to these uh, competi competing phenomena. Um, we, uh, another hallmark, another sort of distinctive feature of, uh, of yes, no, it does, uh, of the materials with strong correlations are the physical properties being strongly renormalized as compared to band theory. So uh, if we look, for example, at the dispersion of quasi particles in strongly correlated metals, they are often very different. Uh, from the ones we see in, in band theory. Uh, and you can call this a failure or at least a limitation of single particle descriptions for which we need to develop methods to include these strong electronic correlations. So uh, there are in fact two very classic routes to, uh, uh, to investigate um, that, that give, give rise to, to strong correlations in materials. There is uh, one route which is uh, distinctive of multi-insulators, 
and systems which are close to, to multi insulators. Uh, and the physics which is at stake here is really the blocking of charge degrees of freedom. So in strongly correlated electron materials, uh, as in any materials, electrons repel each other. But the distinctive aspect of such uh, materials is that the screen, the typical energy scale for screen Coulomb interaction, which is traditionally called U, the Hubbard U, is comparable to the kinetic energy of electrons, which is typically associated with the bandwidth. So when these two energy scales are comparable, you can run into phenomena where the motion of electrons in the solid is impeded by the strong Coulomb repulsion. So this is the MOT route to strong electron correlations in its extreme form. It can give rise to uh, uh, the material being just an insulator. When by band structure considerations, you would think that the material is actually a metal. And this is just because if the repulsion between electrons is too strong, electrons don't want to move. I'll come back to that. Another category of materials is the so-called heavy fermion materials. So in those materials, uh, we, are, we mostly have metals uh, and often uh, fermi liquid metals, uh, but these materials contain two, two different fluids of electrons. Electrons that, that reside in very broad bands, the so-called conduction electrons, and electrons that are localized in the atomic uh, orbitals of typically rare earth atoms, for example, so very localized orbitals. And these two species of electrons talk to each other through something which is called a hybridization, which is just an overlap of wave functions which allows electrons to drop between these two fluids, between these two types of orbitals. But again, this hopping or this hybridization is strongly blocked by the Coulomb repulsion. It's hence renormalized downwards as compared to its bare band structure value. And this leads to the so-called heavy fermion behavior, which is that eventually at low energy, low temperature, the system does develop metallic quasi-particles, but their masses are very, very large. Okay, so let me elaborate a little bit more on these two routes, these two traditional routes to strong correlations. The first one is very, the MOT route is very easy to understand. You can think of, uh, for example, the, the Paris subway at showers. Uh, all the electrons are very, very densely packed. But there is a Coulomb repulsion, well, not Coulomb in this case, but there is a repulsion between the electrons or between people. It's not polite to step on the, on the feet of your neighbor. Uh, and hence, uh, you know, this leads to blocking of uh, the motion of. Yeah. So that's exactly what happens in a multi insulator. The, the motion of the electron is blocked by, uh, by uh, the repulsive. And uh, this is an example of the phase diagram of the very uh, famous uh, case, of the multi insulator. Uh, is here. Uh, and you see that uh, the function of temperature and pressure in this uh, family, in this material, V203, go to chromium. You can go from at low pressure a multi insulator, in which the electrons are localized on the orbitals, and at higher pressure, a metal in which uh, the electrons can move around. And then this smart insulator can also order eventually at low temperature into an anti -ferromagnet. So uh, this is an illustration of what I was saying before, is that this competition between localization and delocalization leads to uh, uh, competing phases and a rich phase diagram. So let's go now to uh, the other uh, route to strong coalitions that I was uh, talking about before. Namely, heavy fermions. So, this is a sort of a cartoon of what happens in a heavy fermion material. At high energy or high temperature, which is the right panel here, uh, as you see here, you have the two fluids of electrons that live sort of an independent life. You have localized electrons, the red arrows, which act basically as local moments, as spins, which are localized on their atomic orbitals. And you have conduction electrons, which are depicted here as block waves. And these two entities live independently. As you go down to low temperature, below a characteristic scale, which is called the Congo temperature, these two species of electrons interact with one another and hybridize. The conduction electrons strain the local moments, forming the singlet state. 
And this leads to a coherent gas of wave-like quasi-particles, but with very, very heavy masses. Okay, so these are two very time-honored routes to strong electronic correlations. The mod phenomenon has been known since the uh, has been known since the 30s of the previous century, and uh, the heavy fermion uh, has had its uh, period of fame, especially in the mid 80s and uh, yeah, in the mid 80s. Uh, but the main message of the talk is that there is actually a, another. Uh, route to strong electronic coalitions, uh, which is um, uh, controlled by another energy scale, which is the hum the Hund coupling. So not so much the Hubbard U, although it does play a role, but the key player here is the Hund coupling. I will explain a little bit better later what it is. Uh, and the distinctive aspect of this uh, of these materials is that it leads to very itinerant metals. But with very strong correlations, so again, strong normalization of quasi-particle uh, properties. Although these materials do not contain two fluids of electrons, in contrast to heavy fermions, and also are not close to mod insulators. So it's really uh, another route to, to develop strong correlations and materials. And uh, the awareness that this route is possible uh, came on, on stage, especially because of the study of iron based superconductors, and also, as we will mostly see in this talk, of transition metal oxides of the 4D series. And I will take for the talk one specific example, which is strontium glutonate, that yeah. uh, Michel uh, Cote also likes a lot. Mm -hmm. It's one of my favorite materials. Uh, okay. So uh, you can summarize the main message of the talk uh, in this uh, in this way. Uh, basically, not only you uh, <laughs> makes uh, all these words seem right, but also J, the, the homescape. Okay, so this is uh, an outline. I don't know if I managed to, to, to get to the bottom of the talk, but uh, I, I will first uh, start by trying to convince you that the, the Hulms coupling as uh, two antagonistic effects. So so I, I will do that at the level of models. Basically, I will show you that the wound coupling has two opposite effects. Uh, then I will take a little detour and very briefly introduce you to the machinery, the theoretical machinery that we are using to understand this sort of uh, materials, and especially in this context of wound metals, namely the Newton infield theory, which uh, Michel mentioned in his introduction. And then uh, I will uh, illustrate all this on strontium alternate. Okay, <clears throat> so uh, this is sort of a cartoon to, to get started which illustrates the difference between a mod system or rather a metal, which would be close to a mod insulator and, um, and a, a wound metal. Okay. So in a mod system, I don't know if on Zoom they see my mouse. Yes, I they do. Oh, they do, okay, so that's, that's even simpler. Uh, so uh, in a mod system, you have first and foremost, one important type of excitations, which is very simple to understand in terms of atomic physics. You have a shell, let's say a transition metal D shell, which contains an electron, and you can remove an electron from this D shell or add an electron to this D shell. So in terms of atomic physics, atomic excitation, it's a very, very simple type of excitations. It's a balance changing excitation. And of course, in an isolated atom, this would be a sharp spectroscopic line, but if you, have a lattice of atoms, this line becomes broadened, and this gives rise to a broadened atomic excitation. The removal process is called the lower Hubbard band, and the addition process is called the upper Hubbard band, and especially the lower Hubbard band can be mapped out by photoemission spectroscopy, which is a removal process. On top of that, so if we have an insulator, this is the only thing we have basically, we have a lower Hubbard band, an upper Hubbard band, and a gap between the two, uh, the typical energy separation between these two uh, kind of states, I will call U effective. As you will see, it is not just about U, 
It is a combination of the hub value and the whole coupling J, and that's a very important point of the form. So this is why I call it U protective. And then if we are in the metal, not in an insulator, for example, if we dope uh, the mod insulator, or if we are at the value of U, which is slightly below the mod transition, uh, because we are in the metal, there are also low energy excitations that are the quasi particles. And if you look at the total density of states, this gives rise to a uh, region of low the density of states for low energy excitation at, uh, in the middle of here. Uh, something which has a spectral weight Z, which is smaller than one. So basically, one minus Z is in the lower and upper about band, and Z is in the quasi particle. So this is the, on the left, the situation in a in a, in a multi insulator, uh, and here I have taken uh, uh, illustrated this at the bottom by thinking of an atom that we in the ground state that would have three orbitals. So that's appropriate for sponsor mm -hmm. in effect. For example, where the five D orbitals uh, split into a T two G triplet and an E G doublet, uh, and uh, you have a certain number of electrons in three orbitals. So these are the three colors at the bottom. And the, the, the case here on the left corresponds to the, the, the case where there are three electrons in three orbitals, which is called a half hit shell. So you can put at most six because of the polyphony. So the removal is going from three to two, the addition is going from three to four. Uh, on the right here, you have a different case in which, which is characteristic of the wound metals I'm going to talk about. And what you see here, is that we still have a lower and upper of our band, but they are separated by an energy U effective, which is quite a bit smaller than in the left case, so they can even overlap, which is why they are uh, very naturally metals. There is no gap. And on top of that, we also have quasi particles, and all these features are more mixed than in the first case. So here, what you notice on this slide is that uh, if you can read the, the small formula here, you will see that U effective is written on the mod side as being u plus 2j, and here as being u minus 3j. So I will try to explain this uh, in the next slide. So what is this u effective? Well, this u effective is very different if you have a half-filled shell, like here, or if you have a partially filled shell, like here. Okay, so I will try to explain that. This is very simple. How can we uh, estimate u effective? We just consider the charge transfer process. So we take two, two atoms, let's say in the half shell, each with three electrons, and we take one electron from this one. So we get an atom with two electrons and we transfer it to the other one. The other one will have then four electrons. And then we look at the energetic cost for doing this. So the energetic cost for doing this is uh, <clears throat> the energy of the final state, which is E of n plus one plus E of n minus one minus the energy of the initial state, which is 2 E of n, and for each, we take the ground state. So you just have to, if you have isolated atoms, you just have to count the electronic configurations in all these different uh, shells. And the algebra is here, you don't need to go through this, just trust me. And you will see that uh, in the case of the half shell, which is the second case, U effective, which is this, uh, estimate of the charge transfer energy is U plus, here it's written N minus one, but if we have N equal three, three orbitals, it would be U plus two J. Okay. So you see that the effective U is enhanced as compared to the mod about U by a quantity J. What is J? Well, it's the Hund coupling, which is the interatomic exchange. What is this uh, strange animal? It tells you, that uh, you probably all know about Hund's rule, which uh, tell you how to arrange electron in an atomic shell. Uh, and we know since the work of uh, Friedrich Hund that instead of putting the electrons, for example, here with uh, two electrons here, an empty orbital and a, an occupied orbital here, it is energetically favorable to put all electrons in all orbitals with parallel spins. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is the Hund rule coupling, maximize total spin, and maximize also total angular momentum. So you, you spread the electrons around. You can think of this as what happens in a bus where uh, you have two seaters, okay? And so if you have a, a half-hit shell, 
uh, half of the number of passengers as compared to the number of seats. Typically, one person will be in each set of two seats instead of having uh, neighbor, neighbors. Okay. I accept if you like conversation, but let's imagine that electrons <laughs> don't do that. Okay, so these are the wounds, basically. And the wounds coupling J is this energy associated with the gain in energy due to the spreading of electrons around, which is the interatomic exchange, a quantum mechanical effect. Now, if you, uh, if you have a non half hit shell, then you can do the same calculation and you will realize that the effective U is U minus 3J. So you see that for a non half hit shell, the effective U or the typical gap between a lower and upper band band is reduced by J, while for a half hit shell, it's, in, it's increased by J. And so you can immediately guess that it is much easier to have multi insulators for half hit shells than for non half hit shells. Yeah. And in fact, it's a fact of an empirical fact of life or of nature that many of half hit shells are actually insulators. And this is because of this effect, which was pointed out long time ago by Van der Meyer and Dawatsky uh, in uh, Van der Meyer's thesis, actually, and also by uh, Atsuchi Fujimori about the same. Now, there is a second effect of the wound scoping, which is more subtle, and which is best displayed by plotting. This is a model calculation for two electrons in three orbitals. And I will tell you later how this calculation is done. It's done using dynamical field theory. And what is plotted here is this quasi-particle weight Z, you remember, which has the weight of the quasi-particle P as a function of U. And so what you see here is for the, the black curve, which has J equals zero, Z goes down as we increase U, right? Like this, and then at some point it vanishes. This is the mod transition where the gap opens. And this is what happens at J equals zero. But if we increase J, we know from the previous argument that the critical value of U for the mod transition will be increased because we have U minus 2J equals some kinetic energy. So it means that the critical U is kinetic energy plus 2J. So it's going to be increased. So it goes to the right. But at the same time, you see that the value of Z, so the weight of quasi particles, is driven down as we increase J in the metallic project. So it's really a two-sided effect of the Hunskapli. On the one hand, it pushes the mode transition to larger values. So the system becomes a, more of a metal. It's no longer close to a, to a mode insulator. But on the other hand, the spectral weight of quasi-particles, which is also related to the inverse of the effective mass enhancement, is uh, going down, or the effective mass is going up. So correlation effects grow as you increase J, but the mod transition is pushed away. And you see there is a kind of plateau here, right, in which the, the quasi-particle weight is very small over an extended region of U. This is the region of Kuhn metals, which are very correlated metals because they have very small Z or large effective quasi-particle mass, but not by being close to mod transition. So uh, you see that the, the wound coupling has these two antagonistic effects. For this reason, uh, we sort of quote in this paper, we call this the Janus phase uh, uh, aspect of the wound coupling as two phases. Uh, this is the cartoon, which displays the same thing and which contrasts uh, the blue curve, which is the case of a, a small J, so if Z is close to one, we have a weakly correlated metal that would be well, well described by uh, band calculation theory, electronic structure theory. If we, have, if we are here around the blue curve, Z is very small. So we have strong renormalizations due to electron-electron interactions. And we have a metal which has a small Z because it's close to the multi insulating point, which is taking place here. In contrast here, the red curve is for a large J, and you see this plateau, which is a display here in a cartoon way. You can be very far from the mod transition and still have a small Z. Okay, so there is actually a, another diagnosis of this, which is you can think of the different states that the atom takes as a function, let's say, of time or location in the solid. As the, or if you want, the different configurations in the Gans wave function of the system. And you can ask 
what is the statistical weight of a given atomic configuration in this wave function, in this ground state wave function. So in a very uh, itinerant, uh, uh, uncorrelated metal, basically the charge can easily fluctuate between all the different valent states. So you can have n and plus one and minus one. And within a given uh, number of electrons, you can have many eigenstates of the atom, depending on how the electrons arrange themselves. And in a weakly correlated system, they are more or less all populated. So the, the histogram of states looks like the black thing in a, in a weakly correlated system. In a mod system, well, it's very costly to create a charge excitation. So all these histograms will be concentrated on charge N with very little weight on N minus one and in a wood metal, it's a bit of both in the sense that you can have a spread of this histogram over many charge states, but in each of the charge state, the histogram is dominated by one specific atomic multiplet, which is the one which has obeys the Hun's rule, which has the largest spin and the largest head. So the histogram is spread in charge, but it's dominated within each charge sector by the ground state compatible with Hun's rule. So, uh, of course, this is in contrast to photoemission, uh, which was the one particle addition of uh, removal spectrum. This is not something which is so easy to access directly experimentally. Uh, and you see that this notion marries together atomic physics and how the electrons move in the solid, which is basically electronic structure. So to describe this, we need to have a framework that combines together the pictures of localized in space atomic light excitations and the picture of delocalized waves moving like block waves in the, in the solid. And this is very general, a very general feature of strongly correlated systems that you need to have both a description that combines both atomic physics, which is visible at, in the high energy spectrum of excitations, uh, and wave-like delocalized quasi-particles, which is something you would get from block theory and electronic structure theory, but with strong anomalizations due to interactions. And what we really want to, to know is how we go from high energy atomic configurations down to low energy quasi -partic. So this is precisely a way to think about uh, solids, which is embodied in dynamical mean field theory, which is really viewing a material as an ensemble of atoms coupled to a self-consistent medium. So if you open a, a solid state theory textbook, like uh, Ashcroft and Mermin, for example, in chapter one, they will tell you about atoms. And in chapter two to 54, the atoms are gone. And you only talk about block waves of electrons. So uh, this approach doesn't work for strongly correlated systems. It's very important to continue to think about atoms at all chemists know that, uh, that materials are built of atoms. They are not just electron gases. Right? And keeping the atomic nature of, uh, of the system is really important to understand strongly correlated systems. So in dynamical mean field theory, I'm not going to give a long introduction here. What we do is we replace a crystalline solid. This is my caricature of a crystalline solid, it's the lattice of atoms, by uh, one atom in an effective medium that exchanges electrons self-consistently with the medium. So that's the high-level description of uh, dynamical mean field theory. We do this self-consistently, embedding this atom into the coherent crystal. So it's a very natural idea, which is the same idea uh, very related to mean field theory in statistical mechanics, except extended to quantum mechanics and uh, to uh, to each element electrons in a solid. So you can think of this as a, the theory of an atom in a bar. Uh, okay, so let me be a little bit more technical how the theory works. So the theory focuses on the given observable, like any mean field theory, you have to pick an observable. For example, if you do Ising mean field theory, you pick the local magnetization. If you do density functional theory, you pick the local charge density which is a function of the position, but not a function of the energy. 
In the animal theory, we pick a quantity, which is the local grains function, or if you want the local density of states in the solid on a given atom, which now is a local observable, but a function of energy scale. And the fact that this uh, uh, observable is a function of energy scale is the key behind the D in dynamical mean field theory. It indicates the fact that it's a mean field theory that depends on energy scale. And this dependence on energy scale is the crucial point that allows to describe this flow from the high energy world of atoms and atomic excitations down to the low energy world of the, the localized quasi particles. And that's the whole idea. Okay, so in slightly more uh, precise term, uh, the, the theory uh, it, it focuses on this observable and it couples uh, the atom to the path through a self consistently determined amplitude for an electron to leave the, the atom, go to the path, or start from the path and go back to the atom. So you see, it's a theory of the balance changes of the atom in the solid as time evolves or as you look at different places in the crystal statistically. So that's that's the idea. I'm not gonna give you more equations. This, this theory of course uh, contains precise equations that allow to, to, to build an approximate theory of, of uh, strongly correlated materials, but I'm not gonna go through for the details of the equation. Let me just mention one thing, that it, it had one organizing principle uh, which is locality. So the idea is that uh, we're gonna make an approximation by which a certain object, which is called the self-energy of the theory, which measures the difference between the unrenormalized bands and the renormalized bands by interactions, is an object which in the one band case, and I will come back to the multi-orbital case later, is independent of momentum or if you want spatially local. So it's a full function of energy but we're going to assume that only the local component matters. So it's one of the, it's the organizing principle of, of the theory. Really. Every uh, computation method has uh, sort of an organizing principle that controls the validity of the approximation. For example, uh, the density matrix of normalization group approach has another organizing principle, which is entanglement, assuming low entanglement of uh, the ground state and low energy excited states. Here, our organizing principle is special local. Okay, so uh, this consideration gives us a, a self consistency condition, which allows to relate delta and G, the effective liberalization function or dynamical midfield and the local gains function. And so this, this theory has to be solved by solving a self-consistent loop in which for a given hybridization function, uh, we solve this problem of the number of the atom in the bar. This requires computational methods. This is why I became sort of a computational physicist at some point in my life. And then there is a, a self-consistency condition which allows you to define a new delta and you close this loop by converging this, this loop. At the end of the day, you determine delta and G. So that, that's roughly speaking how it works. So let me very briefly give you a little bit of an idea of where this theory is going. It's both a computational framework to, to describe the uh, correlated electron system, uh, but it's also a conceptual framework to think about strongly correlated electron systems. And it's a theory that was invented uh, 30 years ago when I was a lot younger, uh, but it has now evolved into many, many different directions. I like to draw it a bit like a tree, this is my, my poor uh, design idea of the tree. Uh, so there is sort of the conceptual core of the theory, which is what I described before. It's strongly rooted in the development of computational methods to solve this sort of uh, embedded uh, atom problem, which is a computationally feasible, much more feasible than solving the whole problem, of course, but uh, still challenging. And then it has many, many different extensions beyond the uh, uh, beyond the original theory. So for example, making progress towards non-locality is one direction here that has been uh, very much developed, especially by André Marie and his group at Cherbourg, or combining this theory with electronic structure, which is something that Michel is working on here also. Uh, and there are now radio articles basically covering all these three everywhere. So if you are interested, you can look at these radio articles. 
Uh, one thing I want to mention is that under the hood, uh, we need computational methods to solve these uh, equations computationally, and hence the development of ever more efficient algorithms to do that. In this framework, having uh, open source code that uh, implement these approaches is really crucial. And uh, it's quite satisfactory to see that there is now quite an ecosystem of uh, open source code that do that. Uh, here somewhere is the TRIX uh, code that uh, is the one we are developing. We used to develop in France, and we are collecting the uh, mastermind behind this, but which is now developed uh, mostly at the, at the CCQ in New York. But there are many other groups that have released uh, software to do this sort of calculation. Uh, I hope this, this slide is exhausted, but I'm not totally sure. Okay, so one, one thing that uh, happened in the late uh, 90s, early 2000, is that these methods became combined with electronic structure methods to treat real systems. So we are no longer just treating, uh, say, the simple models, but we are treating real systems by, of course, combining, combining this with the uh, beautiful theory of density functional theory, which is the state of the art approach to calculating the electronic structure of solids. So I'm not going to exactly describe how this works. There is sort of a flow chart here, which uh, basically is made of a density functional theory calculation and then an identification of a small subset of orbitals, which are the correlated orbital, let's say the T-shell of the functional oxide. Uh, and we apply these uh, DMFT calculations to this subshell only. We cannot do it for the full system for all our meters in a self consistent way, both on the dynamical mean field delta and on the charge density row. Okay, and this has been applied to many, many different materials uh, by now. Okay, so now that you have uh, some glimpse into what the full methods are and also some glimpse into what DMFT is. I'm gonna sort of combine the two things and give you a concrete example. I think I've been talking for like 38 minutes. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, the, the example I'm gonna uh, talk about is strontium rutenate, popular here. And uh, strontium rutenate is really a very, very beautiful material. Mm -hmm. For many reasons, I, I like to call it the, the fruit fly of transition metal oxide. And let me explain why. Well, first of all, it's probably the transition metal oxides for which the best samples can be grown in the lab. And you know, our field, we are theorists, but without crystal growers and experimentalists and chemists, we would not exist. Okay, so it's very, very important to have materials of high quality. And here is a crystal of strontium glutenate out of my mm -hmm. lab. And you see it's a 10 centimeter crystal, monocrystal. So it's just a little bit more. And with such crystals, you can do basically every single experiment in the, in the uh, economic matter experiment to this toolbox. For example, you can at very low temperature map out the Fermi surface in exquisite details with quantum oscillations. Uh, you can do RPES. Once you manage to clear the surface, you can do basically every single experiment. And you really have to scratch your head a lot to find an experiment that hasn't been done yet. It happened to me once. I managed to think of the C-axis z back coefficient that had not been measured, but you really have to think hard. Okay. Um, so this is strontium glutenate. The other beauty about strontium glutenate is that it's a metal whose normal state is very interesting, as I will try to convince you, but most importantly and most famously, and this is why it's a famous material, it becomes a superconductor at low temperature, not very high, 1.4 Kelvin, not a high TC superconductor, but the, the superconducting state has been the subject of many, many investigations and debates uh, since it was discovered around 1994, and the nature of the superconducting state is still uh, not fully understood. Mm -hmm. And there has been even really remarkable surprises in the recent years. Okay, so uh, what is the puzzle about the normal state of this material? Well, the puzzle is the following. Uh, this is actually a metal with a relatively broad band. It has a 4EE XY like band, not particularly narrow band. And the effective view, the Hubbard view for the system can be estimated by methods I don't want to 
described now, to be about 2.5 dB. So you see it's uh, like half of the bandwidth. So there, there is no way this material can be close to a, to a mode transition. It's not close to a mode transition, but still it's very correlated. How do we know that? Well, from these quantum oscillation experiments that have also mapped this Fermi surface, uh, one can measure the effective mass of quasi-particles, other methods as well. And you will find that uh, for the most uh, two-dimensional band, which is called the gamma band of the system, the effective mass enhancement, so this is the ratio of the mass of the electron in the solid as compared to the band mass calculated from DFT, this effective mass enhancement is a factor of five. So it's almost like helium-3 under pressure. So it's a very correlated liquid. Why? Because we have quite a broad band. Furthermore, the XY band is the broadest, as this bandwidth of 4 EV, while the XYZ bands, being more one-dimensional, have a bandwidth which is about half, but they only have a mass enhancement of three. Mm -hmm. So the broadest band has the largest mass enhancement, which is very bizarre. So this is what triggered my interest, personally, into this system. And this is a quite a general fact. If you look at transition metal oxides of the 4D transition metal oxide series, so not 3D, but the row below, uh, that they are intelligent metals, even good metals at low T for some of them, like spontum of many, but with very strong correlations. How can that be? Uh, so, uh, as uh, you can guess, uh, our claim is that strontium butanate is a member of this big and happy family of wood metals. There is an additional complication for this system, which is that the Fermi level is very close to Van Hoff singularity of one of the bands. As a result, there is also Van Hoff physics in the system. Hund is not the only player, but it plays a very important role. Okay, so uh, very briefly, uh, this uh, material has a Fermi surface which is made of three sheets, white three sheets, because basically we have 3D orbitals that matter, which are depicted here. XY, which hybridize in the plane, and XZYZ, which hybridize uh, more along the lines. And this leads to this Fermi surface here. Uh, to give you an idea, this was the Fermi surface uh, determined in the, I think, uh, late 90s, a beautiful uh, pioneering photo emission experiment by Andrea and Michelle, uh, now at PBC. Uh, and uh, uh, this is what, what was done many years ago. And now with very high intent, very high uh, resolution laser RPS, this is the Fermi surface that you can determine, consistent with the Machelis Fermi surface. But you see the exquisite degree of precision with which even RPS can determine the Fermi surface in complete agreement with the quantum usage. So it's one of these cases where different experimental probes, completely different, measure consistent things, which is not always the case in this field. I mean, it's quite beautiful, this is as, as good as it, it, as good as, as it gets, you know, in the early 23rd century for the issue. Uh, this is an experiment by Anna Tamay and, and Felix Baumberger at Geneva, associated to this paper, and you'll understand why a little later. Okay, so uh, given that we have Oh, the last thing I want to say about uh, about strontium rutinate is that if you look at its normal state, uh, it's obvious, even just from a simple property like the resistivity versus temperature, that it has a very interesting life as a function of energy scale. And let me start from the high temperature end. So this is the resistivity of strontium rutinate measured as a function of temperature. And so what you see is that at high temperature, it looks like an awful mess. Uh, because the resistivity is like million centimeter, and, and I'm sorry, this uh, the gradation here is one is one million centimeter. And so this means that in the whole high temperature range, about 500 Kelvin, if you extract a mean free path for the system from uh, the formula, you would deduce a mean free path smaller than the lattice spacing. So it means that um, you cannot think in terms of the formula at high temperature. Yeah. There are no coherent quasi-particles whatsoever. So it's an incoherent soup, what people call a bad metal. But this bad metal, as you lower temperature, eventually evolves into a low temperature state here, this little square, which is a Fermi liquid with quite low resistivity, a few tens of micro centimeters, so quite a good metal. 
and eventually a superconductor. So it has all this evolution as a function of energy scale from a incoherent soup down to a coherent Fermi liquid. And in between, there is an interesting regime here, which is not a Fermi liquid, has a resistivity, which is uh, not this square in that regime between 100 and 600 Kelvin. Uh, phonons contribute very little to this resistivity, by the way. So this is electron electron. Uh, but uh, the mean free part in this regime is much larger than the lattice spacing. So it's an interesting state of, of uh, metallicity, which is, as you will see, related to the to the wound physics. Okay, so these photoemission experiments, which are very, very high accuracy, allow for this system to directly test the DMFT assumption. So for this, to understand this, we have to generalize this DMFT assumption to from one orbital to multi-orbital. I said that in the one orbital case, the assumption is locality. So the fact that the self-energy is independent of momentum. Well, this remains true in a certain sense in the, in the multi-orbital case, but you have to be very careful in which basis this statement is made. So if you look in the basis of atomic orbitals, which are the X, Y, Z, uh, Y, Z atomic orbitals for the system, the assumption that the MFT makes is that indeed the so-called self-energy is a matrix in these orbital indices, but which is a function only on energy. But now if you transform this matrix to the bad basis, which is what uh, we would calculate in the DFT calculation, or to the quasi-particle basis, which is observed uh, by RPES, uh, you see that these matrix elements here, which are overlaps between the atomic orbitals and the block waves side, can be very strongly momentum dependent, especially because of spin orbit coupling in this system, which gives a very strong angular dependence of this thing. So when you upfold this self energy to the full solid in the quasi particle basis, um, this, the, this self energy becomes strongly momentum dependent. So the DMFT on that is not that this is momentum independent, which would be quite crazy, but is that when you express the system in quite localized atomic orbital against the locality principles, it's energy dependent only. So we can test this because from the emission experiment, we can measure this. Well, we can try to extract this quantity, at least its real part, and then see if indeed this is consistent with this expression with an assumption of uh, momentum independence of this uh, self energy. So how do we do this? Well, I, I showed you the map of the Fermi surface. Uh, by the way, this is a comparison between the experimental Fermi surface, uh, which is the dotted line on the left, uh, and the uh, theoretical Fermi surfaces uh, calculated by DMFT, but uh, so you see, we can get excellent agreement. The way this is done, and there's no DMFT here, it's pure uh, analysis of the experiments. For each angular sector around this Fermi surface, so again, the Fermi surface is here, and photomission experiments make momentum cuts like this, they measure the dispersion of quasi-particles. So you see that for these cuts, they cut three bands. So here you will use, indeed see three quasi-particle dispersion, this is energy versus momentum, the dispersion relation of the quasi-particle. If you cut here, you only see two bands, the, the so circular gamma band and the other one, the beta band. And from this, just by analyzing the measure of dispersion relation as compared to your band structure dispersion relation, you can extract the self energy of the system for each of the angular cut. And when you do that, what you find is this. So you find that the self energy, so this is now the real part of the self energy versus frequency determined from photo emission experiment. And you see that there is a very strong angular dependence. Mm -hmm. So the self energy is very strongly momentum dependent in this system. So if you are naive, you would say complete failure of the theory I was talking about. Okay, but this is in the quasi particle of band basis. Now, what we can do is we can take this data, invert them because we know these matrix elements here, yeah. calculated from electronic structure, the psi chi matrix element. These matrix elements, we can calculate them. And so you invert these relations, 
And all of a sudden, when you extract the self energy in the orbital, in the atomic orbital basis, you see that you can make sense of all these data. They all, for all the different angular sectors, they collapse on two curves. One, which is associated with the XY atomic orbital, and the other one associated with X, Z, Y, Z, which are degenerate for symmetry reasons. And the cloud of points here reflects all the measurements for all the angular uh, sectors. So what, we, what this analysis proves is that the locality assumption, which is at the heart of DMT, is doing a reasonable job for the system, yes. So the question is, uh, the collapse I'm claiming is not perfect. There is some dispersion. And what, what, what is the origin of this dispersion? Well, there are two origins. The first one is that the experiments are not perfect. <laughs> Uh, it's always easy for a theorist to say, but uh, that's also what the experiment is telling. Uh, no, I think it is, uh, it is you know, you, you make measurements at different angular sector and uh, uh, you have uh, anyway an error bar, right? Uh, noise. So there is that. There is also the fact that in this system, I'm not claiming that the GMST approximation is perfect. In fact, there are many reasons to believe that there should be non-local effects because the system does have spin correlations on intermediate landscape. And I will come back to this at the end of the talk, if I ever manage to get to the end of the talk. So there may be some real stuff there, okay, also to answer your question. Okay, but still we can compare this cloud of points to now a full DFT plus DMFT calculation which are the plain lines here. And you see it's doing a quite a reasonable job. There is some departure here, but the slope which is calculated and the overall shape is, is pretty good. So we can predict the effective mass of the system and in good ag agreement with the measurements. This is a comparison between the, uh, the, the RPS dispersion of the quasi-particles for all the different angular plates. And the color, uh, the color map is a color map of the GMFT spectral function. You see that the element is quite satisfactory. Okay, so uh, I'm running a bit out of time. I just want to mention one thing, which is indeed uh, one can show that the origin of correlation in transfer multinet is uh, an illustration of this physics of the wound coupling, plus some effect of Van Poort that I'm not going to describe here. Uh, the paper in which we pointed that out is now about 10 years old. It's this paper we can have co workers. Yane has been my accomplice in studying sponsor mutant for many, many years. And um, the, the story behind that, so let me show you our original results, uh, which are here. You see that if you do a DFT plus DMFT calculation for the system at zero wound coupling, you will get that the system is a weakly correlated system. The enhancement of the effective mass as compared to LDA here, which is the band mass, is only a factor of 1.7. So it's a system with relatively weak correlations. But when you increase the wound coupling, what happened is two things. First of all, you get more or less the right effective masses, but also you get this remarkable fact that the two orbitals now differentiate, they no longer have the same effective mass, and the one which has the broadest band has the larger effective mass. And this is an effect of the proximity of the bond. But the Hunt's coupling increases the mass and makes them, the two orbitals leave more independent lines. So that's really summarizing the wound physics in the system in just one slide because I'm running out of time. Uh, this system has a hierarchy of energy scales. That's also what makes it quite nice. There is a high energy scale, which is U and the bandwidth, which is a couple of units. Then there is an intermediate energy scale, which is about 0.4 EV, which is the wound coupling. Then there is the spin orbit, which is 0.1 EV. And finally, the Fermi liquid scale, which is 25 Kelvin, okay. very going to scale, 2.5 MeV. Uh, and so you can understand the flow of the system as a function of energy scale. And this is what we did in this paper with Fabian Kugler here used to be at Munich, then Rutgers, then now postdoc at CC2, in which we really, using the normalization group techniques and DMFT, follow the whole flow as a function of energy scale from atomic physics at high energy down to the quasi-particle range at low energy. And 
One of the things that appears when you do that, and this was very nicely understood by the group of uh, Jan van Delft and Gabi Kofia at Rutgers. I'm going to skip a lot of things. Uh, oops, not so many things. Uh, one of the very nice things that uh, you yeah. discover when you do that, yes, is that the, the characteristic energy scales that you find along this flow are distinctively different for the orbital and the spin degrees of freedom. So strong thermal planet has four electrons in three orbitals, which means that from the orbital point of view, there is a degeneracy three of the ground state. From the spin point of view, there is also a degeneracy three, because it's a spin one. As a result, the ground state of the atom, of the atomic chain, is ninefold degenerate. And so when you think of the system a la DMFT, where you follow the flow of an atom of two quasi particles, you can ask how are these degeneracy lifted, or how are these degrees of freedom gradually quenched? And what happens in wound metals is that there is high energy scale where the orbitals get quenched, and then there is a lower energy scale where the spins get, get quenched. And uh, this is very nicely seen in the normalization group calculation. So this is a normalization group calculation that we did with, with Pamela Google, in which you see here the orbital uh, screening scale, which is a very high energy scale, and the spin scale. So the orbital scale is here. It's thousands of Kelvin, so it's not very physical. And the spin screening scale is about 500 Kelvin. So there is this uh, separation of energy scales. And this also sheds light onto these different regimes of resistivity I was talking about. The high temperature regime, everything fluctuates. The intermediate temperature regime, the orbitals are quenched, but the spins fluctuate. And this can be also indirectly probed by the Z-back coefficient, which measures the spin entropy, or at least spin and orbital entropy. And you can check that the Z-back coefficient in this regime is indeed consistent with spin fluctuating only. So this is kind of a diagnostic of this. But more recently, I'm going to skip this. More recently, there's been a very recently, in fact, there's been a beautiful resonant inelastic X-ray scattering experiment that has directly probed uh, the separation of scale between orbital fluctuation and the spin fluctuations, because RIGs see orbital fluctuation. So uh, there is this uh, reprint on the, on the web, which has measured the orbital screening scale and the spin screening scale, or the, uh, the orbital mode and the spin mode, and the, char the characteristic energy in this system. OK, so if you give me two more minutes, I would like to uh, conclude on some uh, largely open questions in the field of strong thermal planet. And as you can imagine, a largely open question is it's superconducting ground state. But, and perhaps this will address your question, this question of the superconducting ground state is also tightly uh, related to the nature of spin fluctuations in the system. So this system has spin fluctuations. Uh, we know that from neutron scattering. This is a, the neutron scattering spectrum of uh, strontium multinate. And it's built of two components. And in fact, the fact that there are two components is something that was realized only relatively recently. There is one component which has been known for ages, which is this peak here, which is due to the nesting of the Fermi surface uh, here. Let's say between the 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 beta sheet and the and the alpha sheet. So this leads to a quite prominent spin density wave peak, which, however, does not correspond to a very large correlation length, only like three lattice spacing at two Kelvin. So it's not a system with very long range spin correlations, but it has prominent spin projections around this peak. But there is also a continuum which was discovered only more recently which is this broad response here, which carries a lot of spectral weight, which is broadly centered around the gamma point. And we can show, we can calculate this spin fluctuation spectrum for dynamical mean field theory. And we can show that this continuum is actually completely tuned, com completely related to the Hund coupling of the, of, in the system. So if we increase the Hund coupling, this continuum increases when the other features uh, contribute less. 
Okay, so these spin fluctuations have long been believed to be responsible in part, at least for superconductivity, but it's not so clear whether this spin the, it is the continuum part or whether it's the SDW peak which is responsible for this uh, uh, spin fluctuations for this the superconductivity as a glue, if you want. And the surprise there came just a few years ago. Uh, this system was thought of as being a P wave triplet superconductor, but uh, it was realized by the group of Stuart Brown at UCLA that actually it's not a triplet superconductor, it is a singlet superconductor. I don't want to enter into what was the experimental problem. It's related to the power that you put in the system when measuring the C susceptibility. To cut the long story short, it's now proven that this system is very likely that this system is a singlet superconductor. And that, of course, uh, sort of reshuffles all our thinking about the superconductivity of this system. Uh, there is recent work that has combined uh, this sort of dynamical mean field theory uh, calculations with uh, spin fluctuation calculations here at the University of Montreal and Sherbrooke by Olivier Gingras, Michel, André Marie Tremblay, and Rezan Wakan. And what they have proposed is that uh, there are two favorite uh, pairing states. One which is the uh, dx square minus uh, dxy uh, uh, pairing state here, uh, dxy minus y square on the dxy orbital, and the other one which is uh, an even parity spin triplet, so probably not uh, what's going on, <laughs> uh, depending on the ratio of parameters. This calculation is based on the GMFT electronic structure of the system. But it's also based on an RPA calculation of the spin fluctuations. And so what we know, in fact, we learned a little after this paper, is that the RPA calculation for the spin fluctuation is not perfect. And in particular, it overestimates the, the, the response around the pi pi antiferromagnetic wave vector, which has a lot to do with the D wave state. Mm. So it is sort of an open question whether uh, this uh, proposed uh, pairing state will be uh, robust to a more refined calculation, let's say, of the, of the spin fluctuation spectrum. So I, I don't want to take side on, on this. We are still working on it. Olivier Jandar, who is with us at, at, at CCQ, is still continuing also to work on this problem and other ones. And uh, the, the answer is still open, but this d wave state is obviously a very interesting candidate. Uh, so, uh, so this is an open problem and uh, work in progress. Okay, so I've been already too long, uh, just a few take home messages. So uh, I illustrated a different route to uh, strong correlations than the MOT and the heavy film one, which is based on the Wunsk I didn't tell you too much about that, but it's quite general, and it applies in particular also to the whole family of iron-based superconductors, which I didn't have time to mention. Uh, it applies to quite a few of the 4 the metal oxides. Here are some here in the lower part of this uh, plot. Uh, and uh, as far as transform routinate, uh, I think the normal state is now very well understood theoretically as a sort of Hund and Van Hove metal, put it that way. Uh, many, many of the uh, physical properties that can be measured have been successfully calculated or even sometimes predicted, like the CXCD there, mm -hmm. by these sort of approaches. Uh, but there are still some open questions, uh, which is in particular the nature of the superconducting state. And I will leave you on this and I will acknowledge some of my important collaborators uh, in the team. Thank you. Uh, we may we take a, a few minutes for questions. Um, we have some online, we have some here. Okay, so Amir, you can unmute yourself and ask questions. Uh, hi, hi Antoine, thank you for your presentation. Can you hear me properly? Yes. yes. 
Okay, so uh, you mentioned that uh, CXC's feedback coefficient uh, has not been measured, uh, is one of the promising measurements. On these samples, I was wondering first if it uh, has been measured or not, and what it can uh, validate exactly related to uh, spin orbit uh, interactions at low temperatures. Thank you. Okay, hello, Amir. Yeah, um, so um, this is the story about the Zbeck coefficient. Uh, I'm going to take probably more than 30 seconds to answer it because it's kind of an interesting story. So originally, the in-plane Zbeck coefficient of this material over an extended range of temperature was measured at Caen in the group of Sylvie Hebert and Antoine Mignon. And what they, they observed remarkably that, and I think I have a slide on this that I don't resist showing, uh, which uh, they, they remarkably observed that besides the Fermi liquid regime, yeah, it is, besides the Fermi liquid regime where the Zbeck coefficient is linear in T, like in any metal, in this interesting intermediate metallic regime, the Zbeck coefficient plateaus out at the value, which is about uh, 30 microvolt per Kelvin. And this is true on many different alternates. Actually, there are like seven or eight more that have the same value, more or less. And they observed that this value can be reasonably well explained if you assume that only the spins fluctuate, but not the orbitals, uh, which is exactly what wound metals do. So, so, so this is the AB plane Zbeck. Now, because we were interested in this, and with Yana and Marley, we actually calculated this from BMT, we could agree with this. We also remarked that at the time, the C axis Zbeck coefficient had not been measured. And it turns out that we made a prediction that it would raise to uh, a much higher value than AB plane above 200 K so in this regime. But this is actually for mo mostly for bump structure reasons. And at the time, this had not been measured, but it has actually been measured now by Ramsey Dow. And at least qualitatively, his prediction turned out to be correct. Just so a, one more one more measurement that uh, it's just because of the smaller of a uh, uh, term, so more flat bands. In it's the because there is more and more particular asymmetry okay. when you do the z-axis. Okay. Great. Thank yeah. you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Other questions? Line. Question is about the the, the broad continuum in. Uh, in the spin fluctuation spectrum, right? That's your question. What's the origin? So, the, well, the experiment is the experiment. It means the neutron scattering, right? And um, then we don't see so well because uh, it's a three D plot. So, I well, I mean, uh, what I showed you is not the, the neutron data. It's a fit of the neutron data that the neutron experimentalists have done to make their data more uh, understandable. Uh, so, actually, on the left here. Uh, you have very early results from 1999, right? So this continuum part was already there, but was not so characterized. Uh, I should probably have not done that, but on the right, the only thing you have is the fit of the data, but much more recent data from uh, 2019. So this is the reference here, Stephen et al. I didn't do this fit. This is the experimentalist who did this fit. They decompose their signal into uh, the SDW peaks and this broad signal. Okay, so you just have to accept that from the experiment that they, they can now resolve this broad signal. So now this broad signal we understand as being the uh, spin, the local spin fluctuations right, that appear in this spoon regime of uh, wound methods. So we, we do find in our calculations, that together with this, uh, uh, that there are spin that there are very local in space or broad in Q, the spin fluctuations that remain down to low energy scales because the spin screening scale is so low, right? and that remains in the spin fluctuation spectrum down to low uh, to low energy, and we can document that. And, I don't know if I have this calculation somewhere here. We can document that this is now a calculation from, from the MFT. And what you see here is a decomposition of the signal. So there is this broad signal, this broad continuum, and there is this peak. And we can decompose the, the different elements of this calculated response into these different responses and follow 
how it depends on the whole coupling. And what you see here is that the purple one, which is the local component, uh, is directly related to the wound coupling. So uh, purple is the, the purple the, is the intensity of the of the relatively flat uh, component. So it, it is broad because it's local in real yeah, space. In real so space. So it's broad in Q. The the width in Q is about half of the Benoit zone. So it is really it's really broad. Okay. So there are these two components. And the role that these uh, quasi-local spin fluctuations may play in the pairing is also an interesting question. I should have, uh, I think I have a slide somewhere that shows various uh, studies of superconductivity in models with strong wound coupling, in particular by Philip Werner and co-worker, that have investigated wound coupling-driven pairing. So that's... So, what do you think is the most likely uh, pairing state? Well, I'm not going to commit on this because uh, <laughs> this game has been played for 25 years and people are systematically lost. So, <laughs> so uh, you know, work in progress. Uh, no, I think the, the new wave state is, is a possible candidate, but we also proposed other ones, uh, and um, including odd frequency pairing, by the way. Uh, so, so this fluctuation, uh, this continuum favors more some of the pairing states? Yeah, I mean, these continuous spin fluctuations may favor some odd frequency state, actually. Odd frequency. Yeah, that's what we found, at least in. But you have to realize that making, you know, I'm, I'm somebody who likes to compute things about materials, not only scenario physics, okay? So this is an extremely difficult problem. Uh, it because the energy scale involved is very low. This is a low energy instability of the thermal liquid, and you really because TC is one point four K, right? So it's not one of these systems where, like the ion superconductors, where you become the superconductor at a rather high energy scale, starting from a bad metal above TC above the Euclidean scale. But it's a system in which you first form quasi particles. At 25k, you form them, they are quite coherent. You see quantum oscillations, you know, at a few Kelvin. And then you have a very low energy instability to the superconducting state. So, if you want to achieve my program, which is to follow the flow as a function of energy scale, you have to follow the flow in a, in a controlled way from very high energy down to 1 Kelvin, right? And people have played this game with FRG, for example, but you know, they don't have the, the first part of the flow correctly because they start from some sort of a bare interaction area and then they apply FRG, which is a perturbative method, basically, blindly. Uh, and, you know, so you first have to use uh, a tool like GNSG to follow the flow for a good part of the flow down to the 25K family Victorian scale. And then you have to use something else. Experiments. <laughs> experiments, for example, but even experiments have not resolved the nature of the yeah. same state, right? Uh, we can discuss why, uh, because you know it's very, it's a very low, small gap superconductor, so it's very hard to do some of the experiments that were possible in two press to resolve the spatial structure of the gap. For example. But, uh, no gap is seen in APES, for example. It's, it's very good. Okay, so uh, thank you for uh, joining me to thank uh, Antoine for this interesting and exciting work on, the, on this year. Thank you.